Welcome back everybody to our studies in criminal law. In this episode we're going to be talking about non-fatal offences and we're going to take an introduction to the subject of non-fatal offences before unpacking them over the next five or six lessons. Now this is the penultimate series, uh, or at least penultimate set of lessons on specific criminal offences, because after this we're going to do dishonesty offences, which is just mainly theft and fraud, um, and some other smaller element crimes. And then we're going to move on to the final topic of criminal law, which is defences, capacity defences, as well as defences which relate to necessity, so things like, um, things like duress and self-defence, for example. Uh, but for now, like I said, we're talking about non-fatal offences. Um, the subject of non-fatal offences is going to basically be the scope of this next series of lessons for the next few lessons. And this lesson is just going to outline the scope of those next few lessons, just to give an idea of the types of non-fatal offences we're going to be covering. We're only going to be covering the most basic of these. There are others that, of course, exist. Um, they're a little bit more niche and esoteric um, that aren't really going to be part of the mandate of this series of lessons. More so, we can do them in future, maybe, or maybe even members-only videos, um, if people so choose. Generally speaking, we'll be focusing much of our attention on both the common law offences of assault and battery, but also the offences, uh, some of which are found in the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. Uh, these are the sort of two areas that we're going to be spending the most of our time. So, question is, what are non-fatal offences? Well, as you can probably understand, um, you've come this far in criminal law, you're doing a law degree or you're doing an A-level in law or something, uh, and uh, as you would probably think, the name suggests non-fatal offences are those which are harmful, which look to harm somebody or to threaten harm to an individual or perform some kind of what we would describe quite abstractly as a violent act, but they don't kill the victim. They are offences that are not fatal. So if the victim dies as the result of some violent action, then this can never be a non-fatal offence because it wasn't non-fatal. Instead, it is a fatal offence and would constitute something like murder or manslaughter, for example. Now, there are generally two directions that one can go down when we examine the basic non-fatal offences. There are the non-fatal offences established by the common law common assault and battery, which is going to be the subject of the next two lessons. But then also you have the offences which are cited in the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, which sort of just build on the things that have been established in the common law provisions on non-fatal offences. So common assault, for example, and battery. Uh, and then they add to it with things like assault occasioning actual, uh, actual bodily harm, GBH, GBH with intent, etc, etc. And it is almost like something of a ladder, really, because you can you can view the fate non-fatal offences as having a sort of level of severity as you go up the scale. Um, on the bottom of the scale, you have what would be described as the sort of assault and battery common law offences. Um, and then as you go into looking at the Offences Against the Person Act, you start to see that the scale of severity increases. And in conjunction with the scale of severity increasing, of course, you would understand that the the sentencing and the punishment that is associated with the commission of that offence also starts to increase as well. So assault occasioning actual bodily harm is the next of these offences, and then we get into the really serious non-fatal offences, which include grievous bodily harm, and then finally grievous bodily harm with intent. This is really what is going to be outlining the next few lessons. We're going to do a video on common assault, we're going to do a video on battery, we're going to do a video on assault occasioning actual bodily harm, and then we'll do a video on uh, grievous bodily harm, and then finally grievous bodily harm with intent. What I want to do in this video is pick up on the work that we have been doing in the last lesson, which is to start exploring the non-fatal offences that we're going to be covering in this series on criminal law. We're going to begin with assault or common assault. We'll talk about what it is, how it is defined, the acts and the mental state that is established in um, a successful commission uh, of assault, as well as a little bit of case law to illustrate these points as well. So, like I said, we're covering the crime of common assault or technical assault as described in some textbooks. Um, this is for the purposes of non-fatal offences. And really, if we just get dive into it really, really quickly... Uh, contrary to the popular opinion that is often cited at, in various different circumstances, assault of this kind 
does not actually require the physical attacking of an individual. In fact, that is a battery. Um, in reality, common assault simply requires the causing of what is seen to be a, quote, apprehension of harm. Just like with any offence, there will be an actus reus requirement, but in addition to this, there will be a mens rea requirement as well. So, like I said here, the causing of the apprehension of harm. Now, that doesn't in and of itself represent the actual causing of harm, the apprehension of harm. What does this mean? Well, there isn't a requirement when we think about common assault uh, for there to be actual physical attacking of an individual, but rather causing the individual to apprehend that harm is going to take place. This may amount to a threat, it may amount to the raising of a, your fists at a person, waving some kind of weapon at the person, um, all of which would constitute various elements of assault, because what these represent is a situation where the victim is apprehending some kind of immediate unlawful violence against them. And so even if you do not go about the full, uh, go to the full logical conclusion of what these things actually do, like threats or raising your fists against a person, um, as in you don't actually go and attack them, then this is still necessarily tantamount to representing common assault. The actus reus, therefore, in this, in this element, in this crime, is the victim is being caused to apprehend that there is some immediate use of unlawful force against them so essentially what we mean by apprehend is that um, they they are expecting immediate use of unlawful force they believe that it will be uh, there will be immediate use of unlawful force against them um, uh, uh, immediately and uh, <laughs> and by that extension right now at this point when it comes to the mens rea for assault then we have to think about the two ways in which this can actually take place because assault a common assault can be achieved either through basic intent i.e the defendant in question intends the victim to apprehend the immediate application of unlawful force against them this is very easily satisfied if i ra if i'm in an argument with somebody and i raise my fist to them or i square up to them then i'm intending uh, by just the very nature of the uh, by extension of this the victim the person who is i'm squaring up to to apprehend that i'm going to use uh, unlawful force against them i'm going to apply unlawful force against them immediately in lieu of basic intent, there is also the idea of uh, defining or ascertaining common assault through recklessness. The defendant is reckless in their action such that they may foresee their action causing the apprehension on the part of the victim to the immediate application of unlawful force against them. So even if they didn't intend to actually cause the victim to apprehend immediate unlawful force, if they've acted in a way that they should reasonably foresee would cause somebody to apprehend apprehend immediate unlawful force against them, then this would also constitute the mens rea for assault on the account of the fact that we're talking about recklessness. Finally then, let's just talk about a basic case from 1975 that illustrates the point of which we are trying to uh, uncover, the case of Crown versus Vienna. In this case, the defendant had caused a disturbance, which led to the police being uh, called, uh, that should say called. Upon attempted arrest of the defendant, there was a violent resistance, which caused the defendant to injure one of the police officers. It was held at first instance that when we're talking about recklessness in terms of the mens rea for assault, this is something that was established by the case of R. Vienna. Um, it was directed by the jury that recklessness was a sufficient consideration for the mens rea of assault. The defense argued that the common assault didn't require intent. It could not be satisfied by only mere reference to recklessness, in which case they would have won uh, the case if this was true, given the fact that it was uh, effectively held or it was effectively uh, understood on the basic of, a basis of the facts that the defendant hadn't intended necessarily to cause the apprehension of harm, um, but instead they were reckless in their doing so and they should have foreseen that this apprehension would have existed. Um, but the decision was therefore appealed. 
the Court of Appeal dismissed this consideration, and they agreed with the prosecution, or at least they agreed with the uh, the judge at first instance, who, who directed the jury to suggest that recklessness was a sufficient consideration for the mens rea of assault. In the previous lesson, what we did was spend some time talking about common assault for the purposes of non-fatal offences in the criminal law. This lesson is going to focus on the next of the non-fatal offences, which is, of course, battery. Uh, we'll get on to looking at what battery is, how it is defined, what the actus reus for battery is, as well as the prerequisite mens rea that is established or required in order to establish a successful uh, prosecution of battery. So, fundamentally, we remember from the previous lesson that common assault required there not to be the actual physical application of violence that was unlawful against an individual, but rather the causing of the victim to apprehend the immediate application of violence against the individual. And we use the example of squaring up to another individual, getting into an argument with someone, squaring up to them um, as a sort of way of, um, uh, of indicating that you're ready to have a fight or you're ready to attack them or raising your fists or waving a knife at them or something. All of these things do not represent the actual application of violence. They instead represent the apprehension of violence. Well, when we talk about battery, we can think about the actual attacking of an individual. This is what battery is. Battery involves the actual attacking of the individual. In fact, battery can almost be seen as the logical conclusion to what was established in, uh, in, in an assault. If I was to raise my fist to somebody and I cause them to immediately appreciate the fact that there is going to be an unlawful application of violence against them, then this would be assault. If I then go and take this to the logical conclusion and I actually do throw a punch and hit them, um, then this would be battery. So, in terms of the actus reus for battery, you can understand that this is quite easy to understand. Uh, in fact, it makes, it makes battery a very easy thing to understand, both in terms of the actus reus and the mens rea of the offence. So, the actus reus of battery involves the actual application of unlawful force against the victim on the part of the defendant. So, again, contrasting this to common assault, the idea of assault was the apprehension of the application of unlawful violence, whereas battery is the actual application of unlawful violence against the victim on the part of the defendant. When it comes to the mens rea for battery, well, again, this also has very similar uh, requirements to that of the uh, uh, mens rea for assault. The defendant has to first intend to apply unused for, uh, unlawful force, or they can do so recklessly, i.e. they acted in a way which they should have reasonably foreseen would have led to the application of unlawful force against an individual. In terms of a number of cases to illustrate these points, I want to first illustrate the point from the case of R. Martin from 1881. It illustrates that the direct application of force need not be a requirement for a conclusion of battery to be reached. What do I mean by this? Well, in this case, we're talking about a defendant who had turned the lights out in a crowded theatre, and in addition to this, had placed an iron bar over the exit to stop people from getting out. And so what happened as a result of this was that because people started to panic um, as a result of the lights being turned out, they tried to run out of the theatre, not knowing that there was a metal bar over the, uh, over the door, which then caused a number of them to be injured in the process. So given these facts, the actual application of force was not done by the defendant. The defendant didn't actually apply force to these individuals. They just created the conditions necessary to allow force to be applied by way of the iron bar, stopping them from getting out and people running and getting crushed and, and hurt in different ways. It was a more indirect application of force, if you will. Um, but this still was a conviction on the part of the defendant. They were still convicted for battery on this basis. Well, in, fact, in this case, it was for GBH. But GBH is built on the fact that we have things like battery taking place. 
In addition to this, they was also uh, they also made a point that recklessness is also very important in terms of being able to establish the mens rea for an offence. They say the following. They say that the prisoner must be taken to have intended the natural consequences of what he did. This is a point of intention, of course. He acted unlawfully and maliciously, not that he had any personal malice against a particular individual who was injured, but in the sense that doing uh, in the sense of doing an unlawful act calculated to injure. Welcome back everybody to our subject lessons in criminal law. We're continuing talking about non-fatal offences in this video, focusing on the idea of assault occasioning actual bodily harm. This is the next major non-fatal offence that we're going to be going through. And then after this lesson, we will talk about uh, GBH, grievous bodily harm, and then finally GBH with intent. The previous two lessons spent some time looking at the common law non-fatal offences, these being common assault and common battery. We noted that assault requires the apprehension of the immediate use of unlawful force against a victim, whereas battery actually required the actual use of unlawful force against a, um, against a victim. We can make a clear delineation between assault and battery. If I was to raise my fists to an individual, this could constitute assault. If I then went to go and hit that individual, the act of hitting them would represent a common battery. This lesson is going to start talking about the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. Um, the first major non-fatal offence in this regard is the assault occasioning actual bodily harm. Now, assault occasioning actual bodily harm is found in section 47 of the Offences Against the Person Act. And it says the following. It says that whoever shall be convicted upon indictment of any assault occasioning actual bodily harm shall be liable and kept in penal servitude. Now, of course, the keeping in penal servitude is, of course, something that is representative of the quite esoteric and niche language that existed in 1861. But what's important here is the person is convicted upon indictment of any assault occasioning actual bodily harm. It's not particularly useful in terms of defining the offence and defining what is required for the offence, but luckily we have plenty of case law to illustrate these points. So, what this simply means, what assault occasioning actual bodily harm means, is that assault or battery must cause an actual bodily harm. That's it. And so when we think about this, we have to just take out of our minds for a second the part where we're talking about assault occasioning, and let's just focus on the actual bodily harm point. Actual bodily harm simply refers to some hurt or injury to a victim. The delineation here is that the harm must be substantial, but it needn't be permanent or serious, more than just trifling or transient. That is the definition of actual bodily harm. It is a, a kind of injury to a victim that is more than just trifling or transient, but it needn't be um, uh, permanent or serious, okay? It has to be substantive enough to be more than trifling and transient, but not substantial enough to be permanent or serious. One point of confusion here that you need to make it very clear is the word assault, when we're talking about assault occasioning actual bodily harm, actually means either technical assault, i.e. the common assault, or common battery. The way this works is it is a constructive liability offence. So just like um, constructive manslaughter, for example, or unlawful act manslaughter, what we do here is the act itself, the actus reus, is what is constitutive of actual bodily harm, but you do so with the mens rea of either common assault or common battery. And so that's what happens here. We use the, we use the common law offences um, uh, of assault and battery, the mens rea of which, to then construct actual bodily harm on the basis of those offences. So the mens rea for the offence of actual bodily harm is simply the associated mens rea either for common assault or common battery, depending on the facts of each case. And we've talked about those in previous lessons where we are talking about either an intent to commit assault or to commit battery, or a recklessness where there is a foreseeability required to show that this person um, had foreseen that uh, an assault or battery would have likely taken place. Now, 
In terms of the harm that is caused, or the type of harm that is caused, the case of Crown versus Ireland is very, very illustrative of this point. Because it extends what really can ultimately me uh, could ultimately be both assault as well as actual bodily harm, um, and it, it 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 expands not only the apprehension element on the one hand, but it also expands to uh, looking at the type of harm that is caused on the other hand. So. The defendant in this case had made a number of phone calls to three women over a space of a relatively short period of time. When the women answered the phone, the defendant would simply remain silent on the other end. So they were silent phone calls. Over time, these phone calls would cause the women to all suffer some kind of psychiatric illness because they all feared for their lives. And rightfully so, if there are multiple phone calls and they're silent phone calls, this is particularly scary and uh, could uh, really uh, cause the women to fear that these people, uh, the people might try to harm them in some way. Now, the defendant would appeal his conviction of Section 47 on the basis of two points. Firstly, he said that silence, the act of not doing anything, cannot amount to an apprehension of harm for the purposes of common assault. And secondly, psychiatric illness cannot amount for actual bodily harm for the purposes of Section 47. And so it expands the definition here. It expands the definition, firstly, of what apprehension of harm can be in terms of common assault, but it also expands the definition as to what amounts to harm. Does psychiatric illness amount to physical harm? It's not being hit or hurt physically, but does it amount to harm for the purposes of Section 47? The House of Lords dismissed both arguments, arguing first that silence can amount to the apprehension of harm, and it's very easy to understand why, even though silence on the end of a phone call is a particularly passive thing to do, it can still cause an individual to um, apprehend an immediate and unlawful harm against them. That person could have broken in straight after the phone call. That person could have been stood outside watching them as they um, answered the phone, all of which would cause an individual, uh, especially a woman um, who may be living on their own, to actually apprehend some immediate use of unlawful force. And then they also said that section 47 is limited to bodily injury. And when they say that it's limited to bodily injury, they include psychiatric illness. A psychiatric illness is part of the body and it is considered to be bodily injury for this purpose. So both arguments that were presented by the defendant were uh, had been had failed by the house under the House of Lords. And so the result here was that they were found guilty of this offence. So we've noted already that this is a constructive liability offence. It is a constructive offence. Just like with our discussion of unlawful act manslaughter, the offence is constructed out of the performance of other lesser offences. So the lesser offences that are performed are the common law offences of assault and battery, but then the requirement is that you have the mens rea of one of these two lesser offences, and then the act of doing so leads to a circumstance whereby the uh, we, we, we perform the act, which is that of actual bodily harm. So the harm that is required is more substantive, but less than uh, more than trifling or, or transient harm, essentially, is what we're talking about. Finally, then, let's talk about the 1992 case of Savage uh, versus the Crown, Crown versus Savage. This um, case involved the consideration of two parts of this Offence Against the Person Act, in fact. Um, firstly, in relation to Parmenter, um, was Section 20, which we're going to get to in the next lesson, which is GBH. But then in relation to Savage, which is the purposes of this lesson, is Section 47, which is, of course, assault occasioning actual bodily harm. So what had happened in this case... Uh, was that uh, Savage had thrown beer over the ex of her boyfriend. She was subsequently charged and convicted under Section 47 of the Offences Against the Person Act. She argued that she lacked the prerequisite mens rea because it required intention or foresight of some physical harm. But this was dismissed by the House of Lords because it was argued that because this is a constructive offence, all that you need is the mens rea for one of the common law uh, assault or battery offences. So all you need is the either the mens rea for common assault or the mens rea for battery. Liability is then constructed from the lesser offence, the mens rea of this lesser offence, and then is built upon to become ABH 
on the basis of the nature of the physical harm that is caused. Um, again, more than uh, transient or trifling, uh, as described. And so the result here is that the mens rea for this offence is particularly low, because all you re require is the mens rea for either a common assault or battery. And then the act itself um, represents whether or not we would go beyond just a common battery or, or go up to the, uh, the, the threshold necessary for assault occasioning actual bodily harm. We will get to section 20 in the next lesson and, uh, and the lesson after when we talk about uh, GBH and GBH with intent. But just to note that the, the, the mens rea for this offence is slightly different to that of section 47.